Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that may not be suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. She was lying on the smooth pile carpet, crumpled and soft-looking. She lay on her back, her left leg tucked beneath her, her head facing the ceiling, her hands to her throat, her eyes open and bulging. Classic strangulation expression. I've just read you a portion of an unpublished manuscript written by Perry March after the disappearance of his wife, Janet Levine March. Though the case was almost entirely circumstantial, after 10 years, cold case detectives finally had enough to charge Perry March for his wife's murder. But by then, he'd moved to Mexico. Janet's parents had won a civil suit for wrongful death, and they were also trying to gain custody of their grandchildren. Tennessee authorities, working with the FBI and Mexican officials, arranged extradition while keeping Perry March's indictment a secret. This is a twisty and fascinating case, and with scandalous details being leaked to the press by both sides, it is one of Nashville's most famous murder trials, especially given that Janet's body has never been found. Putting the salacious details aside, we need to first remember our victim. Janet Levine March was an artist, and a beautiful young mother who adored her children. And her life was stolen from her by her arrogant, self-absorbed, and egomaniacal husband. A man who to this day is petty enough to sue the Tennessee correctional system over the taste of prison food. Welcome to Episode 19, The Disappearance of Janet Levine March. Part 1. If you listened to my first episode on the murder of Dr. Rachel Maidens, you heard me describe Brentwood, Tennessee as a wealthy suburb of Nashville. Forest Hills is similar, except that it is smaller and even more exclusive. It's only 9.3 square miles, or 24 kilometers, with a population of just a little over 5,000 people, as you can imagine, it's almost 97% white and that 97% is most certainly part of the quintessential 1%. Forest Hills was developed as a suburb of Nashville in the wake of the post-World War II population and economic boom in 1957, just five years before the metropolitan Nashville government was formed. It was created as a result of conflicts between suburban and city residents as Nashville struggled to deal with the rapid growth. Nashville actually is having this same problem now. It is at the top of every list you see touting the best cities in America to live in. And it's growing so fast that Metro can barely keep up. Nashville voters just rejected a massive transit plan that was designed to help relieve some of the congestion. How we will keep expanding and growing remains to be seen. Many lifelong residents feel they are being pushed out of their beloved city. But back to Forest Hills, as the name implies, it's composed primarily of steep wooded hills. These steep-sided hills were covered with forest until the early 20th century, when residential development extended south from Nashville. In addition to the area's many hills, the area had an abundance of fertile farmland within the Otter Creek watershed. Many small farms were there in the 19th and early 20th century. Although remaining 19th century structures are rare, Forest Hills contains a number of significant houses built in the early 20th century. With improvements to automobiles and road systems, this section of Davidson County became the preferred area for country estates by the 1920s. Properties built along Hillsboro Pike were similar to those built in nearby Belle Mead, as both became home to the area's most prosperous businessmen and professionals. By the late 80s and early 90s, when our story takes place, Forest Hills had become home to the elite of the elite. Million-dollar mansions, gated communities, doctors, lawyers, CEOs, and one young artist who happened to come from a wealthy family. Janet Gail Levine was born in 1963 to Lawrence and Carolyn Levine. Lawrence, or Larry as he was known, was a native New Yorker, who had earned undergraduate and law degrees from the University of Michigan. He founded an insurance defense practice in Nashville, 
the firm of Levine, Orr, and Garaciotti, which led him to become one of the most prominent lawyers in Nashville and made him socially prominent within the city's Jewish community. Janet was the second of their three children. Her goal was to become an artist, perhaps a magazine illustrator. By the time she graduated, she had already exhibited her work in some of the city's restaurants and in its Jewish community center. After attending the prestigious University School of Nashville, where she had been vice president of her class, she was accepted at her father's alma mater, the University of Michigan. Her friends and family say she was an extraordinarily passionate artist, to the point of being seen as the stereotypical artist, meaning she was a bit eccentric and impulsive. A gorgeous, petite brunette, Janet was popular even though she could be a bit flaky, something her college friends and later adult friends found to be an endearing part of her artistic personality. She was known to dash off to Chicago for shopping trips without much notice. She was forgetful and chronically late. But her creative spirit was matched with a great intellect. She even held a patent for a collapsible baby chair she designed, though she never followed through to market it. Perry March was born in Michiana, Michigan in 1961 to Arthur and Zipporah March. Perry's paternal grandfather changed their name from Markovich to March. He later insisted it was not to avoid anti-Semitism, but to simplify the spelling. But it's not like he would have been the first Jewish immigrant to choose a name that helped him better assimilate in America. Perry's Israeli-born mother, Zipporah, died suddenly of an overdose of barbiturates in 1970. Though it was officially ruled an accident, most people who knew the marches believed it was suicide. Though, of course, this is unsubstantiated, I also read that some believed Art had a hand in her death. Considering his actions later in life, it's understandable why people gossip about Zipporah's death. But realistically, all signs point to suicide despite what was said publicly. Art has always maintained that she had an allergic reaction to the drug Darvon, a painkiller, and that she died of anaphylactic shock. But two different death certificates say barbiturate overdose. A half-empty bottle of Darvon was found in her bedroom. And naturally, in 1970, there were still plenty of old-school coroners who would use accidental overdose as a euphemism for suicide. And many friends of the family believe that Art went to great lengths to characterize her death as an accident in order to protect his children. Because for all his faults, and he had plenty, he was crude, overbearing, and often a bully. Arthur March was a dedicated father. He never remarried and devoted his life to his children. Just as Perry became a successful lawyer, his brother Ron became an entertainment lawyer and his sister Kathy a dentist. All of the March kids were high-achieving and well-adjusted, despite their father's shortcomings. Though the family was Jewish, the children attended a private Catholic school. His father wanted them to have a better education than what was offered in the Michiana public school system. And Perry was an exceptional student, but he was also quite the jock. He played tennis and lettered in wrestling and soccer. He also studied karate becoming a first-degree black belt while still in high school. Much is made of his black belt after Janet's disappearance. There are many theories of the crime, and a lot of people felt he could have easily killed five foot three, 110-pound Janet without even spilling blood. After high school, Perry claims he was accepted to several prestigious colleges, but chose to attend the University of Michigan for in-state tuition, as well as their Chinese studies program. He also later claimed to be fluent in Chinese. You'll notice I use the word claimed a lot when talking about Perry. He had a habit of bragging and exaggerating that fueled his burgeoning arrogance. In short, Perry is and was a bit of an asshole. It was at the University of Michigan that a mutual friend introduced him to Janet Levine. Stacy Goodman was Janet's roommate and would also later move to Nashville becoming a doctor and joining the same elite social circles that the Marches belonged to. Perry often told the story of how they first met and that Janet overslept and missed their first date. They were supposed to go to a synagogue on Rosh Hashanah, 
It's interesting how he always points it out, highlighting her somewhat flaky personality, as if in a cute way, when he actually found her to be a bit spoiled. But once they did begin dating, they did fall deeply in love and were inseparable, moving in together almost right away. Perry would later speak of her in loving terms, something that can be hard to reckon with once you get to know him better. But then, of course, in those early interviews, he still insisted she was missing and that he had nothing to do with it. So, of course, he spoke lovingly of her. He said he was drawn to her beauty, her southern accent, her sense of humor, and her artistic and whimsical personality. And to be fair, by all accounts, the couple was deeply in love and had a passionate, though often volatile, relationship. I think they were drawn to each other because they were so different. But those differences would later overshadow the deep love and attraction they had had for each other. Marriage has a way of amplifying all the things you love about your partner. And sometimes, when a marriage is failing, those very quirks you had adored can turn into something you hate. After graduation, Perry moved to Chicago to train at a brokerage house, and Janet followed him. But she finally talked him into moving to Nashville, her hometown. She also gave him more incentive than just her love. Her parents offered to pay his way through law school. The couple moved to Nashville, and Perry was accepted to Vanderbilt Law School. While he was still attending Vanderbilt, Janet, tired of waiting, proposed herself. She got down on her knees in Percy Warner Park and asked Perry to marry her. The couple married in 1987. And the Levine's generosity towards their daughter and her husband continued. They gave them the money to buy a huge house on 32nd Avenue before Perry was even out of law school. And later, they would also help finance the over 5,000-square-foot French country-style home in Forest Hills. Janet was obsessed with the construction of her dream house and designed every aspect of it. The house was beautiful and very unusual with many cubbies and hidden passages, exactly the sort of home you would think such a creative and talented young woman would design. At the same time that Perry was enjoying the bounties of marrying into the Levine family, Arthur March was struggling. His Michiana home was foreclosed on in early 1986. Larry Levine bought the home back from the bank and allowed Art to live there. The family's official story was he lived there rent-free until he was encouraged to move to Nashville to be close to his son's family. But in truth... Real estate records show that the Levines actually evicted Arthur March for failure to pay rent. The Levines sold the house about a year later. But evidently, there weren't any hard feelings because they invited him to move into their own home and then loaned him money so that he could start fresh in Nashville. Although this benevolence was certainly for their daughter and son-in-law's sake. Because Arthur March was a known liar. He's as arrogant as his son, but not nearly as polished. He has said that he was in the Green Berets and Special Forces. He claimed he retired as a colonel. A spokesman for the Army with an evident sense of humor said, quote, If he thinks he's a colonel, he's never complained about the fact that his pension payments reflect lieutenant colonel status. Arthur March's Army records show that he served mainly as a pharmacist and lab officer in an Army hospital while on active duty from 1950 to 1953 and that he was in the reserves and never saw action. He continued working as a pharmacist in Michigan after he married Zipporah and started a family. As I said earlier, after his wife's death, he was lauded as a single dad, a man who raised smart and ambitious children. But for whatever reason, he struggled once they were adults, losing the house in Michigan and needing the fresh start that the Levines so generously offered. And despite the fresh start, in 1991, Arthur March filed for bankruptcy in Nashville. His messy financial situation didn't change much over the years. And this seems to be something that Perry was ashamed of and lied about. He often bragged that he came from money and a long generation of successful Jewish businessmen, which couldn't be further from the truth. But for all his bragging, Perry did back it up with some of his own successes. He did very well at Vanderbilt. He made the law review and was headhunted by major firms from all over the United States. 
but he chose to sign with Bass, Barry, and Sims. Although it was known to be a particularly waspy firm, in the late 80s, prominent members of the Nashville Jewish community used BBNS almost exclusively for their legal work. So word has it, BBNS was eager to hire a Jewish lawyer. And Perry March fit the bill. He signed on and started a promising career with BBNS. At this time, I'm going to pause to hear a word from our sponsors. Perry and Janet's first child, a son named Samson, was born in 1990. A daughter named Zipporah for Perry's late mother followed in 1994. The children were nicknamed Sammy and Zippy, and they were much adored by both their parents and grandparents. The same year his father went bankrupt, Perry also faced what was called a career setback at the time. It may have been characterized as just a setback, but it was much more serious than that. A paralegal at BBNS found the first of a series of anonymous typewritten letters on her chair at her desk, written by a secret admirer who wrote effusively about her body and exactly what he wanted to do to it. One of the letters read, quote, I want to inhale the essence of you. I want to taste your arms. The pure animal sexiness of your body grips me and embarrasses me. If I were granted a single wish in life, I would not hesitate for that wish to be to devour you. This is what I think of most often. I have always wondered about men who have affairs. I could never understand them. It would devastate my wife and it breaks my heart. But marriage has a way of making sex boring at times, routine and old. I do not mean that it loses pleasure. We still climax. We still love passionately. We still love our partners and aim to please. I want you to cry because you never knew how good it could be. I suppose there is no denying that Perry had a way with words, however creepy the effect was. He continued leaving notes with much the same content, and the paralegal went to the firm's management and complained. Finally, in one of the letters, Perry suggested a way for the woman to answer him. He asked her to leave a note in an obscure volume on tax law in the firm's library. The firm hired an outside investigator who set up a hidden camera in the library to catch who came to check the book. The paralegal played along, and soon the camera caught Perry reading her note. The firm gave Perry the option of being fired or officially resigning and seeking professional help. They sent the paralegal on paid vacation and let Perry take his time deciding what he wanted to do. But obviously, seeking help would alert his wife. But at this point, I take the firm to task. They should have fired him outright and supported the paralegal in suing for sexual harassment. But they didn't. And when she returned from her paid vacation, she immediately ran into Perry in the firm's small parking lot. She furiously quit, and they demanded payment or she would sue Perry for sexual harassment and the firm for allowing it to go on. Perry was then fired, and he agreed to pay the paralegal, who, by the way, I am not naming on purpose, though her name is in Perry's trial transcripts. The deal was for $25,000, to be paid out over four years with the first half of 12500 to be paid out in monthly installments and the second half to be paid out in a lump sum at the end of the four years. He did somehow manage to keep the payments a secret from Janet, though shortly after leaving the firm, they did enter marriage counseling. By 1993, Perry confided to Carolyn Levine, who had taken on the role of surrogate mother to him since his own mother had died during his childhood. He told her the couple were having problems in their marriage. After leaving BBNS, he moved to his father in law's firm, Levine Orr and Garasiati. He did well there and started exclusively representing some high profile clients like local nightclub owners. He also did a lot of pro bono work for the city's Jewish Community Center, where he was also a member of the board. Janet continued her artistic career and was often seen eating lunch alone in local restaurants while she worked on her sketch pad. She had become a successful illustrator of children's books. But with her marriage failing, she had become aloof to her friends and did not discuss her relationship in detail with them, although friends later said she did often appear to be depressed. They just thought it was the mercurial temperament of an artist. 
1994, the year after Perry was ousted from BBNS, their daughter Zippy was born. They felt it was time to move their growing family to a larger home and bought a four-acre lot in Forest Hills on the city's south side, where they spent 1995 building a $700,000 stone house in country French style to Janet's specifications. Contractors who worked on the 5,300-square-foot home remember Janet, who was heavily involved in the project, as particularly difficult. They said she always threatened to go to her husband or her father, who, by the way, held the note on the house, when there was even a small dispute. When Perry showed up to deal with the problem, they said he was often more reasonable. I left this description of Janet's behavior in the story because these contractors did testify to it at trial. But I'm not going to lie. Characterizing Janet March as a difficult woman serves no one, not even Perry March. So what if she was difficult? This was her dream home. She designed every inch of it and was paying a hell of a lot of money. Why shouldn't she be particular and demanding? Unfortunately, the March's marital difficulties only worsened following the move. Although Perry had begun seeing a psychiatrist and Janet sometimes accompanied him, as well as going on her own, he began to spend nights away from the house. See, here is where I get angry again about Janet being labeled a difficult woman. Because court records, not to mention his own terrible behavior, proved that Perry was the one with emotional issues. He was also a chronic cheater. Though Janet was mostly kept in the dark about his affairs. Later, after her disappearance, Perry threatened a lot of defamation lawsuits to local newspapers for these rumors, but he never followed through. However, there was not one whisper of infidelity on Janet's part. Mutual friends of the couple claimed they saw him in the company of other women. He asked a client who owned a popular nightclub in downtown Nashville if he could move into his spare condo. When Perry was home, he and Janet continued to argue, sometimes in front of the children, which led Carolyn to speak up and tell him he needed to leave the home. Perry told her that Janet was considering a divorce. During that summer, the two began seeing the psychiatrist again together, arguing with each other so vehemently in his office that the psychiatrist suggested a trial separation. Perry later said that he had rented a house for that purpose, but had not yet moved into it. In one of their last sessions, he recalled, Janet asked Perry if he told the psychiatrist why he had had to leave BBNS, which he had previously explained to the psychiatrist as being due to a conflict with a co-worker. So it would seem she did know the full story, or was at least suspicious enough to bring it up in their counseling. But we will get further into that later. Neighbors said that Perry had a bad temper, often getting into confrontations with one elderly neighbor and yelling at the others who had the nerve to drive or walk up to the cul-de-sac where his new home was located. For a man that really cared about appearances and often bragged of his business acumen and family fortune, he could never control himself around people. They all knew who he really was, and they ran to the newspapers after Janet's disappearance. In mid-August of 1996, when the final $12,500 payment was due to the former BBNS paralegal, Perry wrote her a letter asking if she could wait until October, as he was having trouble getting the full payment together. By now, Janet may have finally had enough of Perry's shit and was ready for divorce. Deneen Beard, the March's housekeeper, later testified to seeing a book on divorce on Janet's nightstand earlier in 1996. On August 14th, Ella Goldschmidt, the children's nanny who came two days a week to help Janet out while she worked, said that when she showed up for work that day, Janet did not chat with her like she usually did. She seemed withdrawn and upset and told Ella that she would be working on her computer all day, closing the office door behind her. This was something Ella had never seen her do before. The next day, friends of Janet later testified that when they spoke to her, she seemed distracted and for once opened up saying she was a little afraid of Perry. Janet also called her mother Carolyn that day on August 15th, asking her to accompany her to an appointment she had to see a divorce lawyer the next day. This would be the last time that Carolyn spoke to her daughter. Also on August 15th, two cabinet makers who had worked in the house during its construction 
came there in the afternoon to do some warranty work, installing two new countertops in the kitchen and fixing a leaky faucet. They later testified that Janet supervised them closely while Perry played outside with the children. They finished their work in about an hour and are the last people outside of her family to have seen Janet alive. That night, after the children were put to bed, Perry claims he and Janet started arguing again. He had spent the last two weeks at local hotels, and he says that around 8 p.m., he offered to go to a hotel again for the night. He insists that she said no and informed him that she would be leaving and taking a solitary vacation away from him and her children. When Janet was younger, yes, she was known to pick up and go out of town as she pleased, but she had stopped this when she became a mother. Janet was devoted to Sammy and Zippy, and it would have been completely out of character for her to leave so suddenly without leaving detailed plans for her children's care. But according to Perry, she packed some clothes into two bags and a suitcase, got into her gray Volvo with her passport, $1,500 in cash, and supposedly a bag of marijuana. He claims she was leaving for two weeks, even though she had a big birthday planned for Sammy on the 25th, just 10 days later. And as with many things Perry later claimed about his wife, I could not find any evidence that Janet smoked pot or was even a drinker. Obviously, it's possible she did. I'm just saying there is no evidence of this, and it seems to me that Perry was busy painting his wife as not only the flighty artist type, but also as a pothead who would take off on the spur of the moment. This characterization is directly contradictory to how family and friends describe Janet. Perry also said she had left him a written list of chores to do while she was gone and then left around 8.30. Shortly after 9 p.m., phone records show Perry made a series of calls to family and friends telling them that Janet had left him and the children. He first called his brother and then his sister, both of whom lived in the Chicago area. At 10 p.m., he called Laurel Rumel, a lifelong friend of Janet's he had confided in about the couple's marital problems, and told her that Janet had left. Another detail that always irks me about Perry is how he always went whining and confiding to her friends and family. I think it speaks to his controlling nature. He always insisted on telling people close to her his side of the story. So he's always the victim and Janet was portrayed as careless and spoiled, when actually, she was rather private about their problems and therefore rarely defended herself to these people. At midnight, he called his in-laws. Carolyn Levine later said that it was unlike Janet to walk out after a fight. Normally, Janet would have made Perry leave. But as I've mentioned before, Carolyn was close with her son-in-law, seeing herself as sort of his surrogate mother. So despite her gut feeling, she decided to believe him, thinking she would hear from Janet the next day. The next morning, the housekeeper, Deneen Beard, said that she arrived at the March home between 8 and 8.30 a.m. for her regularly scheduled house cleaning. She would later testify that the house seemed as though it had already been cleaned. Janet was a habitually neat woman, so if the housekeeper found the house to be suspiciously clean, I tend to believe her. What's more, Perry told her specifically not to clean the kids' playroom. He told Ms. Beard that Janet had gone to California on a business trip. Ella, the nanny, arrived soon after, around 9.30 a.m. Perry gave her the same story about Janet's absence, but went a step further, saying she was visiting her brother Mark, who is a lawyer in Los Angeles. Ella later testified that whenever Janet traveled, she had always let her know in advance and had left detailed instructions behind. Not long after Ella arrived, Deneen Beard had done what little cleaning she could and left. So far, Perry's story was working. Even I could see a normal person not explaining to the housekeeper or nanny what was really going on. And he had made calls to her family that were closer to the truth. He admitted they had fought. He just insisted that Janet had left. As unusual as that was, the family was not that alarmed. Again, they were all very close. At this point, they all knew about the couple's marital problems, but they had no reason to believe that Perry was dangerous. However, the next visitor to the home would raise flags, if not immediately. Marissa Moody was a casual friend, more like acquaintance of the Marches, 
She would later say that she found both of them to be kind of snooty, but fairly harmless, and her son really loved Sammy. She and Janet had arranged a play date for the boys at 10 a.m. on August 16th. She said that when she arrived, neither Janet nor Perry came outside to see her, which she took to be a normal snub from the couple, probably the reason why she didn't raise the alarm right away. Sammy let her in through the kitchen door and said that his mother was not at home. Perry had not known about the play date, something else that would be highly suspicious later. If Janet had really left him a list of chores, why wouldn't she have also told him about the play date? Perry never came out to speak with her directly, but instead told Sammy to tell Marissa that it was fine for her son to stay. Marissa left, feeling slightly irritated and awkward, but again, not alarmed. When she returned to pick up her son at 2 p.m., Perry again was not there. We later find out that Perry had gone to have lunch with Laurel Rumel again, as they were scheduled to discuss new carpeting for his office. Rumel later testified that though they did discuss the new carpet, Perry kept becoming emotional about Janet, which was not necessarily out of character for him because, as I said before, he had often confided in her about their marriage. But she said he was more emotional than usual and had trouble focusing. Marissa Moody would later testify that she had seen a rolled-up oriental rug in the floor right outside of the kitchen and next to the playroom. Little Sammy had been bouncing up and down on it. She thought this was odd, as she had never seen rugs like that before in the March home. Janet's decorating style was more modern and austere, with minimal decor and clutter, and usually the beautiful hardwood flooring was uncovered. This would later be some of the most chilling testimony at Perry March's trial. Because investigators believe that Janet March's body had been rolled up in that oriental rug that her five-year-old son was bouncing on. Southern Fred True Crime is written and produced by me, Erica Kelly. The original graphic art is by Coley Horner, and Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio. I want to give a special shout out and thank you to the listeners I was so honored to meet at CrimeCon. That was such a fulfilling and humbling experience, and I so appreciate your kind words, handshakes, and hugs. And as always, if you enjoyed today's show, tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on Stitcher and many other apps. If you're interested in supporting the show, come check out my Patreon page or my website, southernfriedtruecrime.com, where you can make a one-time donation by hitting the donate button. I also have a merchandise store open at whatamaneuver.net. If you have any comments, corrections, or suggestions, you can email me at southernfriedtruecrime at gmail.com. I love hearing from you guys, and I'm always looking for new cases, so please reach out. I'm also all over social media. Just search the show name in your favorite platform if you'd like to connect with me there. If you're interested in discussing the Janet March case or any other episodes further, come check out my discussion group. It's linked to my main Facebook page. I would love to hear your thoughts. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.